Thanks, Ron. Hi, my name is Elena Fambo, and as Ron mentioned, I am the Remedial Project Manager for the Westside Lead Superfund site. Thank you for participating and for allowing EPA the opportunity to share information about the cleanup activities to date and the preferred remedy. As you may know, Westside Lead was finalized on EPA's national priorities list in March 2022, and since then, the EPA has made strides in the ongoing cleanup of residential yards, as well as making strides in completing the remedial investigation, the feasibility study, and the proposed plan for the comprehensive cleanup of lead contamination in the study area. EPA is taking this opportunity to talk with you and share information about what this all means. Let's do a quick recap on how we got here. Why is EPA working on the west side of Atlanta? In July 2018, an Emory University student collected data on heavy metal concentrations in soil in an Atlanta area garden as part of their doctoral dissertation research. Samples were collected at locations throughout Western Atlanta and surrounding suburban areas, focusing on community gardens. Elevated lead levels in soil were found at several locations in West Atlanta, including on Elm Street and the English Avenue area. Subsequent discussions with community members resulted in the identification of industrial slag, the byproduct of the iron ore process. Pictured on the right, Emory found the surrounding soil to have lead concentrations greater than 4,000 milligrams per kilogram, which is 10 times EPA's removal management level of 400 milligrams per kilogram. We suspect that during the West Side neighborhood's early development circa 1900, slag was used to help level and flatten a very hilly section of the city prior to development. Creeks were filled in and cliffs flattened and leveled in order to build on top of it. And as those sections were first developed around the 1900s, it's probably been in place for about 100 plus years. But in that time, the topsoil that was placed over it has started to wear thin and it's become exposed in some areas. Some of the slag lies just below the surface in others. Emory notified Georgia Environmental Protection Division, who requested EPA address the situation under Superfund authority. Based on that request from Georgia EPD, our Superfund Emergency Response Branch started sampling in March 2019. They started with a small 60 parcel block around the lots where they could see exposed slag with the goal of determining if the contamination extended beyond those few lots. Based on that data set, our removal team quickly determined that they needed to go out further. So they expanded the project in July 2019 to 368 properties. By January 2020, it was obvious that there was a significant issue and a response action under EPA's emergency removal authorities was initiated. At the same time, our team realized that we had not yet found the edge of the contaminated area. So we expanded the site footprint again bringing the total number of properties we wanted to investigate up to 1,087. At this point, our OSCs realized that the scope of this project was likely going to outgrow the emergency response program. Our emergency response program discussed the site with the remedial branch of Superfund and agreed that a handoff of the site was likely to happen. So the remedial branch started to collect samples as a part as part of the pre-remedial investigative process in June 2020. In May 2021, the study area again expanded to cover 2,097 properties. EPA continues to sample property where we can obtain access. This brings us to present day activities. Currently, we have received 1,090 access agreements. We've sampled 1,047 properties and 424 properties were above our site action level of 400 milligrams per kilogram. EPA has been removing contaminated soil from the site for 42 months. In that time, we've completed 155 properties with 269 waiting to be addressed. I should mention that we have been prioritizing properties for removal based on the people living on the property with high lead levels. Children and pregnant women are promoted to the front of the list as they represent the highest risk category. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, since the site has been finalized on the national priorities list, the removal team will be handing the remediation of the site off to the remedial branch officially in spring 2023. 
This transition allows us to access a larger amount of federal funding to clean up this site. Superfund sites are deleted once all response actions are completed and all cleanup goals have been achieved. Now let's quickly discuss the steps in the Superfund process, shown to the right. Please note sampling and cleanup work as well as community engagement will continue throughout this process and residents will not see an interruption in work. The PASI phase involves gathering historical and other available information about the site conditions to evaluate whether the site poses a threat to human health and the environment, and if further investigation is needed using the hazard ranking system. Using the hazard ranking system, sites that score at or above the established level qualify for a cleanup under Superfund's remedial program and are proposed for listing on the National Priorities List, MPL. Since Westside Lead has been finalized on the MPL, we conducted a remedial investigation to gather data needed to characterize site conditions, determine the nature and extent of contamination, and assess risk to human health and the environment. The feasibility study evaluated and compared cleanup alternatives to address and mitigate unacceptable risks posed by the contamination. The goals of the feasibility study include developing remedial action objectives, also known as RAOs, based on the results of the risk assessment. Another goal of the feasibility study is to identify and compare remedial options capable of achieving the RAOs. The proposed plan identifies EPA's preferred cleanup method. There is a 30-day public comment period requesting community input. I will summarize the remedial investigation, the feasibility study, and the preferred remedy here in a moment. Once the 30-day comment period ends, the Record of Decision, or ROD, issues the cleanup decision. It includes responses to public comments and explains which cleanup method or methods will be used at the site. The Remedial Design and Remedial Action, RDRA, phase includes preparing for and cleaning up the site. Once the remedial action starts under the remedial program, the cleanup work under the removal program will end. The site will be deleted from the MPO once the remedial action is completed. To not completely bore you with too many words, we have included the conceptual site model for Westside Lead as a visual aid. During the site background slide, we discussed how historic foundry waste was buried or placed in Atlanta's west side. The contamination can be transported via stormwater runoff and through human activity. In addition, exposed soils can be transported via stormwater runoff onto neighboring properties and local tributaries. Residents, recreationists, and construction and utility workers could be exposed via ingestion, dermal contact, and inhalation. The site is within the city of Atlanta and land use is primarily zoned residential and commercial. As such, open space or parks within the site that could be characterized as ecological habitats are limited. Most terrestrial habitats within the site are associated with residential lots and limited parks and recreational spaces. Ecological receptors could be invertebrate, aquatic species, and birds. During the remedial investigation, 23 soil samples from 12 parcels were collected. We use previously screened soil samples to determine which parcels to sample. The soil analytes included metals, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and dioxins and furans. We compare results to EPA's regional screening levels, or RSLs. If a contaminant concentration exceeded its RSL, the potential risk and or hazard quotient was calculated by use of the highest detected concentration of that contaminant. The purpose of the pre-remedial soil sampling was to determine if contaminants other than lead and arsenic were present at concentrations that could pose unacceptable risk to human health and needed to be brought forward to the RI. Based on this evaluation, EPA determined that sampling for contaminants other than lead during RI field events and other media would be unnecessary. Because lead is the driving site-related contaminant posing unacceptable risk to a current slash future resident. The RI concluded that from the samples collected, no detection exceeded the lead benchmarks in groundwater, surface water, and subsurface soil. 
Additional soil sampling will be necessary to fully delineate extents of impacted surface soil at the site. EPA believes that the data and site information gathered to date are sufficient to support an informed risk management decision regarding which remedy appears to be most appropriate for a given property. These risk management decisions and an evaluation of potential remedial alternatives for the properties are included in the FS. EPA estimates that more than 1,000 properties remain to be investigated. During the feasibility study, the remedial action objectives developed for the site are one, to prevent human exposure, direct contact, and ingestion to soil with concentrations of the COC above levels protective of residents, commercial workers, utility workers, and recreational users, and two, to prevent migration of site-related contaminants, lead, and surface soil via stormwater runoff onto adjacent properties nearby surface water and storm sewer drainage system. The preliminary remediation goal is 400 milligram per kilogram for lead based on the site-specific bioavailability analysis. The target blood lead levels of five, six, seven, and eight micrograms per deciliter were also used in the model to calculate potential options for site-specific remediation goals for the site. EPA selected a target blood lead level of seven micrograms per deciliter as the goal for the project, resulting in a site-specific remediation goal of 400 milligrams per kilogram of lead in soil. Now we will look at the remedial options that were evaluated and the criteria used to designate the preferred remedy selection. Alternative one, no action is required by law as a baseline with which to compare other alternatives to. This alternative is not protective of human health in the environment because it does not meet either of the RAOs. This alternative would leave the West Side Lead site as is with no actions taken beyond what is already in place. In addition, this alternative assumes that existing controls and monitoring would not be maintained. Alternative two is excavation with off-site disposal. Ongoing sampling efforts also would occur to identify additional parcels requiring remediation. Based on current data, implementation of this alternative would excavate soil from an estimated 726 parcels. This alternative would involve physical removal of contaminated soil and transportation to an off-site landfill for disposal. Excavated areas would be backfilled with clean material and graded to provide positive drainage, then revegetated or resodded. Impacted and disturbed areas would be restored to previous condition as much as possible. The assumption for this option is that material with contaminant concentrations not meeting the PRG would be removed and, the la and that land use controls and fiber reviews would not be necessary. Alternative three combines excavation and offsite disposal with a secondary alternative for undeveloped parcels, phytoremediation. Ongoing sampling efforts would continue to identify additional parcels requiring remediation. Based on current data, this alternative would excavate soil from an estimated 410 developed parcels and treat an estimated 316 undeveloped parcels using phytoremediation. Phytoremediation uses plants to remove, transfer, stabilize, and destroy contaminants in soil. Application of phytoremediation would require further assessment to determine the best plants as well as potential ecological exposures posed by the species planted. Phytoremediation requires initial plant installation, followed by regular maintenance and monitoring over an extended period of time. This is estimated to take about 10 years. Land use controls are also required to ensure no disturbance to the plants that would affect remedy performance. Undeveloped parcels would not be able to be developed until the cleanup levels have been met. Plants may accumulate lead or other toxic materials that reach levels hazardous to human health or the environment. If a plant reaches such hazardous levels, characterization and appropriate offsite disposal would be required. Parcels where phytoremediation would be implemented may have contaminants left in place at concentrations above the PRG, and the land use controls and fiber reviews would be necessary. Alternative four combines excavation and disposal with a secondary alternative for undeveloped parcels, in situ solidification and stabilization. For all parcels with soil lead concentrations that exceed 400 milligrams per kilogram, 
Soil within zero to one feet would first be excavated and sent for off-site disposal, while soil within one to two feet would be subsequently treated with an in-situ solidification slash stabilization. In the solidification process, contaminants are physically bound or enclosed in an impervious matrix. Stabilization involves addition of a stabilizing agent, resulting in reduced contaminant mobility. The resultant soil matrix would have immobilized the contaminants in a soil slash cement matrix. The solidified soil surface would not support vegetative growth and would likely require maintenance because weathering would erode the solidified matrix over time. Land, land use controls and five-year reviews would be necessary to determine long-term effectiveness. This alternative will also be the most expensive to implement. And lastly, Alternative 5 combines excavation and disposal with a secondary alternative for undeveloped parcels capping. A protective cover, a clean soil layer, will be placed on undeveloped contaminate, contaminated parcels with potential for commercial zoning. The cover or cap will isolate Isolate contaminated materials from humans and the environment by covering them in place with a physical barrier to prevent direct contact, reduce erosion, and reduce infiltration. Typically, the barrier is constructed of clean soil engineered to reduce rainfall infiltration and vegetated layer to reduce stormwater runoff and fugitive dust. Because contaminated materials would be left in place, land use controls and five-year reviews would be required. This table highlights just a few of the screening criteria. To see the entire decision table, please refer to the feasibility study posted on the site webpage. EPA's preferred cleanup alternative is Alternative 2, excavation and off-site disposal, which builds upon the previously completed removal actions by EPA at the site. The preferred cleanup alternative is based on the determination that the reasonably anticipated future land use of the site is residential, and the proposed remedy would not limit land uses or interfere with any redevelopment plans for the site. The major components of the preferred cleanup alternative are excavation of lead contaminated surface soil up to two feet, backfilling areas with clean soil and revegetation, resodding, and offsite disposal of contaminated soil in an EPA approved permitted solid waste landfill. Just to put all of this in perspective, I would like to reiterate again that we are currently in the comment period phase of the proposed plan. The record of decision is scheduled to be published in late fall of 2022. The remedial design is scheduled to be completed by early 2023, and the plan remedial action is scheduled to begin in spring of 2023. Now I'm going to pass this presentation back to Ron, our Community Involvement Coordinator, to discuss community participation. Community participation is a very important part of the EPA Superfund process. EPA invests heavily in creating opportunities for the community to participate in its decision-making process. Because of this, the 30-day comment period was created. During this time, community members may submit comments that they have on our decision-making document called a proposed plan. And this period for the West Side Lead Superfund site began August 26th of 2022 and ends September 25th of 2022. You may submit written comments by mail or email to the project manager, Elena Famble, at famble.elena at epa.gov or mail them with a postmark no later than September 25th of 2022 to Elena Famble. U.S. EPA Region 4, Superfund and Emergency Management Division, 61 Forsyth Street, Southwest, Atlanta, Georgia, 30303. Responses to these comments will be included in the responsiveness summary section of the Record of Decision. The proposed plan is posted on the site webpage. Another important part of community participation are access authorizations. It's very difficult for EPA to address properties without signed access authorizations from residents or property owners of a particular property. If you currently live or own property within a study area or know someone who lives or owns property within the study area, we encourage you all 
to get a signed access authorization submitted to us by visiting the Westside LED website or this link below.